Okay, so for the last two games I reviewed, I looked at somewhat obscure games that I really liked. Perhaps I should change this one up with something a bit more well known. Third time's a charm, after all. Hmm, what should I look at today? I know. <clears throat> you guys remember the Super Mario Land games for the Game Boy? I'm sure most of you do. Honestly, these games don't really need much of an introduction. They're Mario games! Everyone knows Mario! The brainchild of Shigeru Miyamoto, Nintendo's mascot, starred many different video games. Yeah, a living fictional legend. Though Super Mario Land 1 and 2 were some of the Italian pub's more unique adventures, especially for the time. Let's talk about them. Start with the first game. Super Mario Land was released as a large title for the Game Boy, alongside Alleyway, Baseball, Tennis, and the undisputed king, Tetris. I think this was also Mario's first ever game on a handheld system, unless you want to count Donkey Kong on the Game & Watch. Now, on the development side of things, this is where things get interesting. As Shigeru Miyamoto, Mario's creator if you're just joining us, didn't have a hand in making Super Mario Land. Instead, things were handed off to a different team at Nintendo, and it definitely shows. I never grew up with this game. In fact, it was released before I was even born. But I do have a bit of history of it. In 2012, on my 13th birthday, I got my first ever 3DS eShop card, and Crush 3D, but that's not important. And believe it or not, the 3DS Virtual Console re-release of this game was the first ever paid purchase I made on the eShop, so unintentionally, I sort of gave myself a similar experience to all those people who got a Game Boy as a gift and this game along with it. Now let's move on to this game's story. The evil alien by the name of Tatanga has taken over the four kingdoms of Sarasaland and kidnapped Princess Daisy. Yes, that Princess Daisy. This is where she made her debut before showing up in every spin-off game ever, and finally became playable in Smash Bros. game as an Echo Fighter of each. In this game, and earlier titles she was in, she was kind of just a peach recolor. Though as the years went by, they differentiated her from Peach by making Daisy more energetic and more boyish than Peach. And I'm glad for that. The Mario universe kind of wouldn't be the same without our perky princess. Anyways, back to the story itself. Mario then heads off to Sarasaland to save Princess Daisy and restore Sarasaland's peace, which was probably a simple task for him since he's already used to saving the day a bunch of times. It's a pretty simple plotline, this is a Mario game after all. That isn't an RPG. But I guess it was a bit refreshing to take on a main friend that wasn't Bowser and save a princess that wasn't Peach at the time, so a bit props for that. Now let's move on to the gameplay. It plays, well, like a traditional Mario game would. You run, jump, bash blocks, cut coins, and stomp on enemies. Although Mario's physics do feel a bit stiff in this game compared to other titles, which can be a bit aggravating, but you can get used to them. There are mushrooms to make Mario grow bigger and allow him to take an extra hit, and there's also the... Fire Flower? Actually, while this parrot may look and function similar to the Fire Flower, this is actually a unique parrot for this game, the Super Bowl. You fired up at a downward 45 degree angle and they bounce all over the place, unaffected by gravity. They also collect coins for you, which is pretty sweet. You can only fire one ball at a time though. It's also interesting to know that Mario's appearance doesn't change when collecting this thing. He looks the same as Big Mario. I'm not sure why he didn't just swap the colors around Mario's sprite, but I'm not going to lose sleep over that or something. The Super Bowl is pretty fun to use once you have an understanding of how it works. It's also super fun to take out enemies with trick shots using this thing. I might go as far as to say I like it more than a traditional fire flower. Also, surprisingly, the Super Bowl came back recently in Super Mario Maker 2 as a power-up in the Super Mario Bros. style, giving Mario a Game Boy Color scheme and playing the Super Mario Land Overworld theme when you have it. I'm actually really happy to see this power-up come back after 4 years of absence. There are also one-ups to fight in the stages. Though they aren't much in this game, instead they're hearts. Which is a smart move on the developer's part, since it would be difficult to distinguish them from the regular mushroom on this hardware. The star is in this game too, and for some reason it plays the Can Can song instead of the traditional star theme. Eh, I'm cool with it. That's the dependence of this game. Though getting hurt in Super Mario Land works off Super Mario Bros. logic, even if you're fully powered up, you'll be reduced back to small Mario. And the regular states don't end with traditional flagpoles, cards, or even that tape thingy. Instead, the stage ends with two doors, one at the bottom and one at the top. If you take the bottom door, you'll go to the next stage as normal, but if you take the top door, before you head to the next stage, you play a little bonus game 
where you could either earn some extra lives or a Super Bowl flower. This game has four worlds, and each world has three levels each. So the game is a bit on the short side with only 12 levels, which is only a third of what the original Super Mario Bros. had. The last level of each world ending with a boss fight. Well, if you can really call it that for the first three. Because these ones are pretty much the equivalent of Bowser, you can take them out if you feel like it, or if you have the power up to do so. But all you really need to do is touch the switch at the end to complete the stage. Oh yeah, this game has shoot up sections, two of them in fact. One under the sea with a submarine called Buried Pop, and one in the sky with a plane called Sky Pop. The controls are pretty simple in these, all you really need to do is move around and mash the shoot button. This definitely ain't no R-Type, these are a nice change of pace. Though I can't see people who dislike shmups not enjoying these stages very much. Especially due to the fact that the final boss is fought in this gameplay style. Yep, not in the platforming gameplay style which most of the game is spent in this one. Yikes, they pulled a Star Fox adventure before that game was even a thing. But even then, the final boss really isn't that difficult after some practice. Now let's talk about the enemy lineup in this game, because oh boy, this game has some interesting enemies. One thing to note here is that, in the original Western versions of the manual, they just gave us Romanji versions of the Japanese enemy names. Like for example, the manual calls the piranha plants Pakun flowers, which is just what they call in Japan. However, the North American e-manual for the Virtual Console re-release of this game gave us some proper English names, so we're going to refer to them using these names instead. At first glance, you probably think these are traditional Goombas, but no, these are Goombos. They're regional variants, I think. It's also interesting to note that according to the manual artwork, the Goombos don't have bushy eyebrows like the normal Goombas do. Though nowadays, I'm sure that's going to remind people of... Are you out of your f***ing mind? No! Jump on me now, <sighs> mother f Then instead of Koopa Troopers, we get Bombshell Koopas. Why they call bombshell coopers, you may ask? Well, after you jump with them, they... Yeah, they explode. There are also bill launches that peep out of pipes, though apparently they aren't launching bullet bills, they're launching bullet pips. <laughs> I don't know why, but I find that name so funny. But the entire enemy roster isn't just variations of Mario staples. There are also some original enemies here too, like these Sphinx enemies called cows. All these robot enemies who try to throw their heads at you called Megabons. The bee enemies called Boon Boons, and much more. I am quite fond of this unique lineup of enemies. They still fit in with the Mario style, and it really does make you feel like you're in a familiar but different part of the Mario universe. Now let's talk about the graphics. Visually, this does look fine for an early Game Boy title. You could definitely tell they were trying to replicate the style of the first Super Mario Bros. here, and I'd say they replicated it pretty well. Though I'd say where the game's visuals really stand out the most are in its world themes. We have Egyptian themed deserts and caves, a mountain area filled with Moai heads, and an eastern themed area filled with bamboo. These level themes are very unique for a Mario game. They're definitely more interesting than seeing the same old standard Mario level themes we're all used to and sick of. Also, I have to talk about the game's music, because this is probably the first thing that comes to my mind whenever I think about this game. Probably because it's so catchy and memorable. The soundtrack was composed by Hirokazu Tanaka, who goes by the alias of Hip, apparently. He was mainly known around the time this game was released for composing the soundtracks for certain NES slash Famicom games, such as the first Metroid and Kadikris, just to name a few. But the soundtrack for this game is probably my personal favourite of all this composition so far. The game's music is so catchy and it's got a great swing to it. My favourite track has definitely got to be the Chris track. It's a great thing to end Mario's adventure in this unique land that is Russell Land. I've been jumping a few years into the future here, but I'm also really fond of the remix of the underground theme that was in Super Smash Bros. Brawl. In conclusion, Super Mario Land is a short, unique, and fun Mario game, as Mario's first adventure in the handheld scene, not counting Game & Watch games, it definitely made a great first impression. But I wouldn't say it's the best Mario game for the Game Boy, as its sequel, Donkey Kong 94, and Wario Land offer much more fulfilling Mario experiences than this game does. That's not to say I think this game is bad or anything like that, I still think the game is good, if a bit on the short side. 
I say the game is worth checking out for its weirdness alone. Game packs of Super Mario Land don't go for too much use, and if you want to purchase the game digitally, it's on the 3DS eShop for a pretty cheap price. Also, if you're into playing ROM hacks, check out Super Mario Land DX, a ROM hack that was released a couple bobs ago actually. This hack gives the game color, as well as updated sprites. So if you're looking for a more colorful Super Mario Land experience, then definitely check this out. But remember to try and support the original release in any way if you can. Alright, now that we're done talking about this game, we can get to the second game. But this video has kind of gone on for long enough and I still have a mini cap on my uploads. So join me in part 2 where we talk about the sequel, Super Mario Land 2 Six Golden Coins. Take care and see you then.